Hi, this is Mike Koenigs, and welcome to the making of a documentary. One of the things that you're going to see in this is I'm actually going to share with you and show you a brand new documentary I just finished producing called Life with Tesla. And if you don't know this about me already, I'm actually a feature filmmaker. I have produced an award-winning uh, film. This is a Silver Effie. It's actually a pretty high-ranking, uh, valuable award. I also produced a feature film called, called Bill's Gun Shop that got major distribution through Warner Brothers several years ago. But um, one of the things that separates a traditional feature film from a documentary is a documentary can be used to increase and raise your value, the value of your products, your services, you. And interestingly, they can be produced for a very, very small amount of money. I'll talk all about the money in a little while. Now, what I'm going to do before I actually share and show the Life with Tesla documentary with you, which is 42 minutes long, is I'm going to tell you a little bit about what you can expect in the next few moments. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what you'll discover here. Number one, I'm going to talk to you about what is a documentary and why you want to use one. We're going to talk about why you want to make one in the first place, how to make one, what you need in order to produce a documentary, how much they cost. I'll give you some price ranges to expect, how long it takes to create, and then how to get started when we uh, come back. I'll talk about some specifics that you may consider doing. Now, the, uh, the bottom line here is, a documentary is a very, very powerful tool. And when I come back after sharing the, doc the documentary that I produce with you, um, I'll go through every element of these step by step. Hopefully it'll answer all of your questions and also give you an opportunity to maybe continue this conversation later on as well. So if you're ready to go, let me open up and share with you the Life with Tesla documentary right now. I haven't paid for gasoline in over 10 months and have driven over 10,000 miles. For every vehicle we sell, it's an additional car that we're getting off the road, which is producing uh, CO2. Weaning ourselves off of oil is kind of the driving force behind Tesla. It is a high-end sports car. It's a high-end sports car that people like to drive fast. One thing about this car is it's a true exotic. I mean, it goes zero to 60 in 3.7 seconds. And it, as I describe it, it'll make your eyes bleed. And if you give someone a ride, the first reaction they have is almost terror. <laughs> They can't believe how fast and quiet it is and how smooth it is because there's no shifting, there's basically no noise. And then they're quiet for about four seconds and then they giggle like a five-year-old. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay. Wait, what's this documentary for anyway? I'm um, just making it because I'm an enthusiast. It would make me really happy if a whole bunch of people watched it and said, you know what? Um, I like the idea of having getting an electric car and powering it with the sun. That would make me very proud. My name is Mike Koenigs. I am a Tesla owner. I have car number 984. It's this very beautiful yellow uh, Roadster Sport version 2.5. I was one of the first off the assembly line right before the IPO. I actually waited, I think, 20 years for my electric car. Now, I only waited eight weeks for the Tesla after I ordered it, and I did get it custom. It turned out I got it right before they went public. So um, it, it has exceeded my expectations. It's an exceptional car. It's easy to drive. I love the fact that I can plug it in every night when I get home, and it's just a joy to drive. It's as close to a legal go-kart as you can have. The price tags on these cars start at about $110,000. They go up all the way to about 160 dollars fully decked out. You get a federal tax credit. Now it varies in price, but it's a substantial immediate rebate that you get. After getting the car, I found out about something super cool. It's these. It's the white 
all access sticker. Okay, what's that mean? Well, it means that the fast lane is available until 2015 and you have to have an electric car to have these. Now, unlike the hybrid stickers that are only good until 2011, the yellow ones, okay, they're not opening it up anymore. So this is a huge benefit, especially if you have commuting to do, which is where this thing really is awesome. And there's some other nice little benefits as well. When you pull up in this thing, you don't have to pay for valet parking. They're like, ah, yeah, I just park here up front. I mean, you get treated like a king. I don't have to pay for, for parking, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, so here's an example of something that was really funny is my wife and I were driving by Costco uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, you know we always were in the habit of stopping in there and getting gas. And she says, well, you want to stop and get gas? And she caught herself, and she looked at me, and we both smiled. And that's when we were like, this is really cool. It's like, no more gas, no more stopping at the gas station, no more thinking about it or worrying about it. It's always full, you know, and it really does change a huge part of your psychology. If you're conscious at all, um, the whole idea that you're walking away and not filling up again, it's, it's an awesome, awesome feeling. The first Roadster was made and well, actually stop. Let's go back a little bit more to the man Tesla Motors is named after, Nikola Tesla a brilliant Serbian electrical engineer and inventor who, while living in Austria, conceived the original design of the AC motor found in, yes, this vehicle. Tesla said the vision, like a blueprint, came to him in a sleep-deprived hallucination. It was 1882, he was considered a mad scientist, and needless to say, people had their doubts. Fast forward about 120 years. 2003 in a region in Northern California called Silicon Valley, where pioneers and visionaries come to act on ideas. Introducing Tesla CEO Elon Musk, who had a vision, but people had their doubts that a high-performance all-electric sports car could compete and give birth to a new approach to alternative fuel cars. It's here in this building in the Stanford Research Park where the designers and engineers are working to continue to revolutionize man's relationship with the electric car. More models, better technology. The Roadsters are built here too. It kind of reminds me of the Lotus a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's actually, uh, the body's designed by Lotus. It's actually all bonded and extruded aluminum which is a really tight uh, fit as well. So you're almost like in a cocoon inside of the car. The Roadster's chassis are manufactured by Lotus Cars in Huffle, England. The completed chassis, along with other parts of the car, are brought here to Menlo Park, where the cars are manufactured. The Tesla Roadsters are engineered for efficiency. The car has regenerative braking, which means the moment the foot is off the accelerator, the car is generating energy. The driving efficiency of the Roadster is 88%, almost three times more efficient than an internal combustion engine powered vehicle. The 2.5 is an all electric high performance sports car that goes from zero to 60 in 3.7 seconds. Zero to 60 in less than four seconds? Ago. Yeah, 3.7. Jeez. Zero to 60 in 3.7 seconds. Zero to 60 in 3.7 seconds. There are approximately 1,500 Tesla Roadsters on the streets in 31 countries around the world. Until very recently, it was the only electric car in production that could be driven on the highway. The Tesla Roadster gets an estimated 244 miles per charge. I saw it set the record though for like, was it 311 miles per charge or something? Yeah, there's someone who actually got even further than that. Really? But they were, um, What's it called when you drive behind like a big truck? Oh, like a drafting? Yeah, they're drafting. It gets all of its power from a lithium ion battery pack, which Tesla Motors refers to as the ESS, or the energy storage system. The pack is made up of ion cells like the ones found in cell phones or laptops. In the Tesla Roadster, there are 6,831 of them. And I think the most important factor is um, the revolution we've seen in technology and in portable technology. So the fact that we now carry in our pockets and in our briefcases, the equivalent of what was a few decades ago, supercomputer, um, and those are all powered by lithium ion cells. Um, and those are now being produced in the, you know, in the millions, if not billions. And what we did is we, our engineers found a way to take those readily available lithium ion cells and produce uh, the Roadster with them, produce an electric car that was uh, pretty much unrivaled that, that could compete with the best cars in the world. Um, you take that technology, that battery technology, that battery chemistry, um, and you combine it with a Tesla technology, which is the way we bring them together in our packs, keep them stable, um, and, and convert their use for an EV, 
and you have what we have today. No more oil changes, no more smog checkups, all of that's been eliminated. And the maintenance on the car is actually once a year, 12,000 miles. Anytime there's ever been any kind of a little repair or anything that pops up, um, they show up at my doorstep. Um, they bring up their trailer. They make whatever changes are necessary. Other than uh, a pair of tires that I've had to pay for, I haven't had to put a nickel in this thing. There's no oil. There's nothing to top off, to fill up. I mean, it just drives and drives and drives. And right now I've got 9,283 miles on this thing so far. The battery pack is liquid cooled, so it always stays at room temperature. The Roadster has very little wear and tear because there are very few moving parts. One battery pack, one motor, and one gear. This creates 295 pounds of instantaneous torque. The acceleration on the car is like nothing you've ever experienced, really. It has nothing to do with normal internal combustion engine acceleration. It's more akin to, if you think about when you flip the switch, the light switch in your room, the light doesn't rev up and then come on. It just comes on immediately. That's exactly how the acceleration in our car works. I mean, you flip the switch and it goes, and you're going 60 miles an hour, almost in the blink of an eye. The best way to kind of visualize what, it's, what that's like is literally being on the roller coaster. So you've probably been to the roller coasters at Six Flags. When you get off of there, your stomach will go up, and it's the same type of experience on this car as well. It's phenomenal. You know, I love roller coasters, and I feel like driving the Tesla Roadster is like having your own roller coaster. I mean, any road, any hill, an acceleration burst up there is like being on your own roller coaster. Like, woo! Yeah. It's just like on a roller coaster. It is. Well, it's about the same acceleration. Yeah. It's like a roller coaster. It's like being in a jet aircraft. Again, without experiencing the car, once you first feel that exhilaration and the pure acceleration, it's, it's incredible. So you're ready for 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds? Here goes. Do you want me to shut up for this? Or no, no, it's fine. It's totally fine. All right. Oh my god, that is awesome. You have so much fun in this car, don't you? <laughs> that is such a different sound. No noise. I know. Because... Just seeing the tires, really. Yep. <laughs> the new guy got out. He was like, it was so weird when we accelerated because you just kind of hear the tires. <laughs> and you hear this little whine, and that's yeah. it. Yeah. There's no noise. In fact, it kind of freaks out the bicyclists and pedestrians when you pull up and they hear nothing and all. It's just this yellow thing coming right straight for you. And whenever I have a hot date, you let me borrow this next time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can program it on how it charges. Now, if I want to, I can either set it up for storage mode, which basically is set up if I leave for a week or longer. This is standard. It normally wants to charge because really this car is all about saving its batteries. Now if I go into range mode, basically it's going to ask me if I want to use this. All it means is that it's going to charge the batteries so they last the longest and can go the furthest distance. Performance is the exact opposite. So in other words, it's all about how can it go the fastest so it'll actually deplete the batteries really, really quickly. Uh, as far as charging, you really have three charging options. You can charge from a standard 110 outlet, which you see here. You can also do a 220 outlet or a 240, which is a standard washer dryer. And then you also have a 440, which is a high powered wall connector. So it's really based on your driving and your needs. All right, how long does it take to charge? Yeah, you know, typically what I'd be looking at is, uh, let's see, we're gonna get some people out of the So what was that last question? 
Man, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> it wipes away memory. The yeah, it basically comes down to charging time. Now, how long does it take to charge? Well, it depends how much power I used that day. But typically, it'll take anywhere from a half an hour to three hours to top it off. I upgraded my power uh, in the house here to a 70 amp circuit, which is capable of delivering 50 amps of power to the car. Every single morning I come out, my car is full and ready for another 200 miles worth of driving. Now, if you go out and you're gonna go crazy and take this thing from zero to 60 in 3.7 seconds like it's capable of doing, um, you're not gonna get uh, nearly that that uh, kind of a range. I kind of gave her a little unexpected uh, acceleration yeah. and yeah, Yvonne was, uh, she was the first one to scream. <laughs> it was pretty funny. You're my last ride of the day. Used up uh, half of half of my charge. Do it really? <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing with people? Everybody came back at the same look on their face. <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah, what was the look? If I was like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. I was like, where the hell have you taken them? Yeah, yeah. The ability for everybody to drive an electric car is definitely coming. There's no doubt in our minds about that at all. Oil will run out. It just will run out. And people aren't going to start driving their cars. We think we have the best solution for that moving forward, which is the electric car. There's little question that when you go to a gas pump, you're no longer just filling up your car. You're submitting to a sense of helplessness. For years, I've been going to the gas station. I put in the handle, and I hate myself. You know, it's like I hated the idea that I'm putting you know, something that I know is bad for the environment into my car. The companies who sell it, in my opinion, are a little nefarious, you know. You've got, uh, um, you know, you don't know where your money's going, and I don't like the idea of that. Look, anyone can make this movement, and if you think forward a little bit, a, if you make the movement towards energy independence, where you're also doing solar panels, I'm basically revealing every step, how much it costs, what kind of decisions you have to make, uh, who you want to look for, what kind of relationships you can build, how easy it is, and you can literally just flip a switch, and in a matter of a few weeks, you can not only be energy independent, and powering your home, and powering your car, and driving something that isn't attached and hitched to some sort of big business and big oil, you know, have an open source attitude about this. And I think that again is, you know, from a very progressive point of view where the world needs to move towards It's let's be free, let's be independent and um, let's be innovators. Let's change the way we think and change the way we live. Electric power is everywhere present in unlimited quantities. It can drive the world's machinery without the need of coal, oil, gas, or any other fuel. I don't want to buy gasoline. That's really what this game's all about. So the sentiment, I think, has always been there. The sentiment, um, people wanted us to succeed or wanted us to be right. The doubts were huge. We have started to chip, uh, chip little bits and pieces of doubt off of that kind of off of off of that collective doubt and. And now more and more people have seen that it's not only possible, it's a reality. And they're coming on board and they're doing it. And now we've seen advances that we never thought possible with it, um, such as people living completely off the grid. Another way we're different from traditional car companies is our objective is not only to sell as many cars as possible. Our objective is really to change people's attitudes and change people's minds about the viability of electric cars. We've been swimming in this pool for a few years now. We've been screaming, look, the water's fine. Come on in, jump in. Um, and, and finally, we're starting to see more traditional conservative car companies do that. So the Nissan Leaf, the Chevy Volt, to an extent, um, it's validation of our technology. It's validation of what we're, we've, been we've been screaming from the mountaintops for a few years now. And to see other car companies, traditional car companies, embracing this. And obviously, we have great partners such as Daimler and Toyota who have embraced uh, what we're trying to do and bought into it to a certain extent, literally bought into it since they're investors in our company. Um, it's very gratifying, it's very validating to see them coming around and saying, hold on, maybe this is a viable solution. I don't have a political feeling about this. But what I do have is, I'm always for the entrepreneur and the innovator. 
I think that the way out of our current economic situation, our political situation, our world situation with terrorism is energy independence. I think that's an obvious apparent thing. According to the CIA, in 2009, the United States consumed 18,690,000 barrels of oil a day. That means in one year, Americans consumed 682,150,000 barrels of oil. And that's just in the U.S. And when you're talking about politics, whether it's the left or the right, both agree that we need to get off of fossil fuels. Both, need, both agree, both sides of the aisle agree that we need to get off of our dependency on oil. Um, they may agree for different reasons, but that's okay. There is really, in this day and age, no reason we should be so dependent on fossil fuels from, you know, historically um, war-torn regions of the world, um, and, and not coincidentally, regions that aren't exactly friendly to Western democracies and the ideals of Western democracies. Um, but in this day and age, we have technology available. That, that can make all that the thing of the past. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a wannabe chef, I think of olive oil and I love cooking. When I think of crude oil, I just think of how addicted this country has become upon a substance, a commodity that we have very little control over. And it's a frightening, both from a national security as well as from an economic perspective, it's frightening to see our, the degree of our addiction to oil. 60% of our petroleum supply comes from foreign sources. Some of our biggest suppliers around the world are Canada, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Nigeria, Colombia, Algeria, and Iraq. Oil is big business. We all know that. They're basically, it's driven and controlled by publicly traded companies that are focused more on their quarterly earnings and their shareholders than us as a customer. And proof of that is the manipulation that we see in terms of the pricing. Just pay attention to what happens during the holidays, for example. Prices just magically increase. And, uh, and obviously we have a depleting supply, and I would suggest that we have sources that come from questionable areas. There's one easy way that, to put it, and I've, I've talked to people about how if the main export of the Middle East was celery, there would be a lot more peace in this world that oil has created a tremendous amount of wars, of strife, of, of subjugation of people, uh, of uh, disarray, uh, and largely because it's controlled by countries that are very unstable, with governments that are not necessarily friendly to their own people, let alone to others. So when you think of the amount of strife that oil has caused in this, in this world, the amount of, 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 of war that has generated, it's really a substance that should be uh, reviled and, and despaired and hated as opposed to something that we is our lifeblood. Free energy will promulgate a forward leap in human progress akin to the discovery of fire. It will bring the dawn of an entirely new civilization, one based on freedom and abundance. For four and a half billion years it's been there, radiating heat and light, sending an unhindered source of energy onto our entire planet giving life to everything on Earth. The sun is so powerful that even with it being 93 million miles away from the Earth, it only takes sunlight eight minutes to get here. Its potential for energy is boundless. But I think the thing that's cool about the whole idea of electric is it's so sustainable. Like, I have solar panels on my house here, and so the nice thing about that is they generate electricity during the day and pump it into the system to provide power for, you know, San Diego for their needs, and then I take it out at night to charge my car. So it's a very sustainable thing. Last year the system generated about 7 million watt hours of power, and I used about 9 million. So I paid for about 2 million, but the solar system generates 7. And so um, it basically covered all my needs for my house and for driving my electric car. You know, another myth is they're saying, well, it'll overload the electric system that we have. Well, the good news is you charge the cars at night. Now, all these power alert uh, one and two things that go off where we have to cut down the air conditioning happen during the day, you know, when you're not charging your car. So the electric car is the perfect solution for getting us off oil and not overloading our electric system the, at the same time. The installation of a solar uh, array on your roof to produce electricity is probably the best capital investment that you can make in your house. Anybody who's thinking about putting in a new bathroom or a new patio or a new bedroom, none of those investments are as effective, as cost effective a capital investment as if you put power generators on your roof. So what I would suggest thinking about here is if you really support the American way of life, which is innovation, freedom, and liberty, you'd take a look at 
powering your house, powering your car, and driving an electric car. I know now that with solar, I'm charging and powering my home and my car completely from the sun. That's a pretty good feeling. And I'm not giving some big business my money. Instead, I'm supporting local Main Street businesses. The Chevrons, the Exxon Mobiles, the Shells have been heavily investing in solar technology, in wind technology. They're trying to get in and control these emerging uh, energy alternative industries. They're not sitting by letting their business you know, slide away. So in many ways, the reason why it's taken so long for us to get real energy reform is because the oil companies are be trying to become entrenched in and control alternative energy businesses. Oh, I, I take pride in my system designs, absolutely. So when I design a system, I design it with the maximum output that they can get from it in mind. And if, if we have to make the cabling a little larger so that they get better performance, it's better performance year after year after year is the way I look at it. We only have to do it once and they get a better system forever. The photons, so the light particles from the sun actually strike the silicon and it knocks an electron free from where it's setting and then the electron along with a bunch of other ones flows through the wire around and back into the module. The electrons flow down in the form of DC current just like a battery to the inverter and then the inverter uses a, a circuit board to change the electricity from direct current into alternating current like you use in your general home applications. So it works basically like a battery, but it, it gets its power from the light particles striking the silicon cells. And the more directly you point those cells at the sun, the more photons strike it. So if you look at, at if my hand were the sun and it's shining on a, an ingot, if it tilts away from it, now you've got a much smaller area that's actually getting illuminated versus facing it directly. But it just so happened that the way my roof is pointed, um, we actually capture, you know, a full southwest sun with no, ch I mean, it's, it, we just happen to be in an optimal area. And that's, of course, one of the nice things about being in San Diego is we have the sun and, um, you know, we'll be producing at 80% most of the, of the year and, and, and upwards during the summer months. It takes very minor shading to affect an array. And things that are, are easily overlooked would be uh, tall, skinny trees like palm trees, uh, even telephone lines. And you'd think that little shadow from a cable going across the roof wouldn't make that big a difference, but it really does with solar. Or not having shade issues now, but five years from now, a tree is tall enough that it blocks out a, a significant portion of the array. So you, you have to look at kind of where things are now and where they're gonna be later, because solar on your roof is gonna last 25 years. The best part of being solar is the sense of independence, the sense that um, you know the sun is feeding my house, it's feeding the car, I'm not buying gas, and if I had it my way, I'd go completely 100% off the grid. The reality is right now, doing a battery system for a house just isn't practical. It's not financially feasible. It just doesn't make good financial sense. From the inverter, when, once we've converted it into alternating current, we send it to the meter and it spins the meter backwards as it goes back out to the power lines, to the transformer, and then whoever around you, your neighbors that need electricity, it goes into their house. You're increasing the value of your neighborhood. You know, you're going to make your home in a reset sale situation more attractive to a buyer. Later on when the sun sets you'll you'll draw the electricity from the grid that you were feeding and it spins your meter forwards and ideally by the end of the, the day you're back where you started and it doesn't cost you anything. Imagine having no bill, okay? The minimum bill I know in San Diego is $4.93. I don't know why, but if you're producing more power than they're using, you're actually pushing it back into the system and back into the grid. Technically, we're gonna start getting rebate checks if our usage is lower than our consumption. The choice I made was to overproduce a little bit so we're feeding back on the grid and get as close to a zero electric bill as humanly possible. My out-of-pocket cost was probably, um, yeah, somewhere around like 20, 20 some thousand dollars, but I get 30% of that off on my income tax. So basically my net cost for the whole system is around $18,000. All right, now here's where it gets interesting. 
If you figure out my normal gas bill for just driving around a car, especially now here in California, as of this time, the gas prices are almost five bucks a gallon. It's insane. I figure I'm saving about 3,600, between 3,200 and $3,600 per year on gasoline. Our electric bill, if you include the car and everything else, was over $300. Okay, so that's let's say another 3,600 bucks, which is roughly 7,000 or so dollars per year. Basically, I get a return on my investment between the solar and my gas um, in less than three years. I'm not giving the, electric, or the gas company any, any money, and um, that gives me a deep level of satisfaction. Look at this. I just received our electric bill. It went down from about $300 per month to under $50, and we're only in May. Next month, and for the rest of the summer, it should be zero or maybe even negative. And that's to power the home, our home office, and the car. Given how right now you can go solar literally for free for almost no money down, um, I'm really surprised more people don't do it. Over half of the power plants in the country are run by burning coal. That's making coal the biggest single air polluter in the United States. When this fossil fuel is combusted, carbon dioxide is emitted into the air. Let's face it, if you have a sustainable green infrastructure and you provide independence for your children and your grandchildren, that's a great gift. If half of the people in San Diego County put a solar power array on their roof, San Diego would probably never have to build another power plant again, ever. The scientific man does not aim at an immediate result. He does not expect that his advanced ideas will be readily taken up. His work is like that of the planter for the future. His duty is to lay the foundation for those who are to come and point the way. We're very lucky. I mean, we're very lucky. We have, we have a very close relationship with our owners. Um, not only, I think, the owners don't, they don't only feel that they own the car, but they do feel invested, invested in our company as well. Um, they know that when they buy a Roadster, they're not just buying a car and walking away. The first time I met a bunch of other Tesla owners in one place, I noticed they were a lot like me. You know, most of them were kind of geeky engineering types, definitely technically conscious, socially conscious, um, green-minded, um, independent. It's probably one of the best purchases I've made, and I can't remember exactly why I did it. It just felt like the right thing to do. I was due for a new car, but I wanted to do something environmentally a little bit more responsible. I saw the car. It was the first zero emission car that would be road ready. I spoke to my husband about it and within 24 hours I had signed up online. I know that it costs us almost nothing to charge it. I mean, it's, I think Marietta's round trip of 20 some miles a day costs like 20 cents. Is that gratifying? Yeah, it's, it certainly is. I mean, what was gratifying to me is when she came to me and gave me her gas card said, here, you'll never need this again. When we bought this car, we were remodeling a home and the home was going to be solar. Um, in the middle of that, my husband found this condo downtown, and so we decided to make the move. But then we ran into other um, challenges as far as putting in an electric charger in a condominium association. So we worked a lot here with SDG&E. Eventually, the electricians who knew the car had worked with putting in the home chargers. They came, they spent almost two to three days here but they had to inventory every electrical outlet in our condominium. And what they did was they took the electricity off of our unit specifically, not the condominium association, and everything worked beautifully. So I, I think that's, it's kind of unfortunate that there's this myth of range anxiety, that people say, well, you know, electric cars won't take off until there's charging infrastructure all over the place. Well, I think most of that comes from the fact that the original cars, the hybrids, had such a limited range. I mean, they were 50 miles, and if you have a 50 mile range, you're really nervous about going pet more than 45, because what if it's wrong? You know, because I mean, battery cars, when electricity quits, it quits. To date, I've only run out of, out of electricity once. So um, I had a meeting in Orange County, and it was in North Orange County. My business partner and I take off, and it is raining cats and dogs. I'm telling you, it is crazy outside. And uh, I didn't do the extended charge, so I just did the standard charge in the car. Remember getting in the vehicle, and it was like 86 miles um, from where we started and then coming back. 
And when you get in the, the Tesla, it gives you the range. The, and basically, I had about 168, 170 mile range. So I looked at it and I thought, oh man, I'm gonna be within eight or 10 miles. So we drive up there and like I said, it is pouring and I'm watching the meter deplete as we're driving up and I realized we're just past the halfway mark when we got up there. And it was because of the, I think, the enormous amount of rain resistance probably on the, on the vehicle. So we're coming home and uh, the meter's going down, down, down and finally it basically says unknown range left. We've got about 14 miles left until we get home and I am just yeah. driving like this and I'm, you know, I'm definitely tense and Rocket, my business partner, is sitting next to me and, and he's like, hey, whatever happens, happens. And so here we are, the Tesla's on the side of the road. Fortunately, Tesla has this great little concierge service. They're sending a driver to come pick up the car, drop it off at my house. I had my little charger cable, but there wasn't an easy place to plug it in. Here's the charging cable if I get in a pinch. If I could just get an extra 10 miles out of this, we'll be fine. Here's the charging cable if I get in a pinch. So the lesson learned is if you're within 20 miles, don't do it. If I get in a pinch, and the other little mistake I made today, and I realized it as I was pulling away, I didn't top off the batteries. Here's the charging cable if I get in a pinch. Which is another little thing to give you that extra 20 mile boost or so, which would have alleviated this little problem. So I think that's the, the infrastructure will come very, very quickly. Uh, it is the wave of the future. I mean, it, there are always naysayers when anything happens. I mean, when any there's a change, it's, oh, this won't work or that won't work. You can always find a reason not to believe that something can work, but it's easier to find a reason how to make it work. And, you know, with the car that Tesla's built, like the Tesla Roadster, you know, gets 245 miles on a charge. Um, and the Model S is, is upwards of 300. So there's lots of, you know, range you've got with that. And remember that when you leave your house or you leave your work, if you have charging at your work like I do, um, your car is fully charged. And so how likely is it for you to drive 200 miles from your house? You know, now, yeah, when you go on a long trip, that's true. But for every day, no, probably not. Life with Tesla represents the fact that this is a no compromise movement. And over the next, say, 24 months, another wave of electric cars are going to be coming out that are more affordable. And also Tesla's own sedans are going to be coming out as well, which are amazing. I mean, beautifully designed. They're no compromise. We're a for-profit company that doesn't make a profit because everything we make, we invest back into research and development for building the next generation car, for building the next Model S, and then the car after that, which will be even less expensive. And so our, our early customers, the people who own Roadsters right now, are the ones who are making the future generation of electric vehicles possible. The objective was never to build necessarily, the objective was never to stop at a $110,000 sports car. The objective was to use a very high-end sports car, take everything we learned from that sports car, and introduce increasingly affordable uh, models. So the Model S is the next step in that approach. The Model S is a sedan, it's four doors, it fits five adults plus two kids, and it will be built from the ground up as an electric vehicle. Uh, as such, it's gonna have a bunch of advantages that are gonna make the combustion cars that we drive today kind of look like horse and buggy cars. Well, if you think about the construction of the Model S, uh, the battery pack lies along the floorboard of the car. So gone are traditional engines, gas tanks, mufflers, all that's eliminated from the car. And all you have is a very, very basic and simple battery pack, motor, a gearbox, and that's about it. And so everything else, everything that's above that is just kind of opportunity for passengers, opportunity for storage and convenience, really. Uh, also, by having the, f the battery pack along the floorboard, the center of gravity of the car comes down. So the drivability, the handling, the maneuverability uh, is much better than what you would have in a comparable sedan. What we're going for with the Model S is to still have a sports-oriented premium sedan um, that will get uh, hopefully the best kind of zero to 60 times uh, in, in its class. So we're looking uh, zero to 60 in under six seconds. The Model S will be on the same platform as an Audi 6 Series, uh, or A6, I'm sorry, a, a BMW 5 Series, the, 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 uh, the Jaguars. That's what we're going for. That's the market we're going for. And we're gonna show that 
an electric car can not only compete on that level, but be actually be a superior car at, on a premium type of level. With the, with the Roadster, the battery pack takes up most of the trunk. I mean, there's room probably for a set of golf clubs and things like that, but this will be a real car. I think they, Tesla did the right thing in making the sports car so people can become aware of them, that electric cars aren't golf carts, aren't little nothings that are ugly, and so they've created that look. Because most of the other ones still out there still look like a roller skate. Uh, I think right now I'm like number 135 for the S series. Uh, I wanted a bigger car. It does seat. I wanted more range. It does 300 miles. And once I get it, I'll get rid of my Lexus, and that'll be it. We'll just have the two cars because there are so few times I drive more than 300 miles anyway. I'm running off the sun. This is, you know, free to drive. And yeah, it's an expensive car, and yeah, it's part of being a leader and stepping up and, and you know, trying to change the way things are done and looking at things not from a status quo point of view. Well, I do think of this car as, as kind of this century's Model T. It's a, it's a really revolutionary car that's showing new possibilities for people that, that, that most people didn't think were possible. You know, if you think about what this represents and means on a big scale, I mean, if we could cut ourselves off from oil and coal, for example, look, that's pretty exciting. Um, it's a great feeling to know that you're part of a movement and part of a, a change of thought, you know, and, and, and switching around and maybe accelerating the status quo. Because I think that once we hit the tipping point, you're going to see rapid adaption, rapid movement, which is going to mean the prices are going to lower. And um, everyone benefits from that. You know, the critics would say, but this is about what can we do right now? How can we change the way things are happening? And do you sacrifice anything by going all electric and by going all solar? I say no. I think this is really the future, and I'm proud to have done what I've, what I've done, and I'm happy to give this documentary away and show folks what life with Tesla is all about and also what life without the oil companies is all about too. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the road, all right? Bye-bye. It is a head turner, yeah. I will say. Let's talk. Five, four, three. Now that I'm just tearing up, that's all it is. It's almost like I want to keep my head straight, like I don't want to like veer the car off course. Get a little extra G. Does this handle pretty well when you oh, accelerate yeah. like that? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's a full-on exotic. Yeah. And um the brakes are exceptional. If I would have had to in that particular situation, we would have been just fine. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's. Um, I wouldn't do anything to risk um, any lives. I mean, this thing is unimaginable in terms of its overall handling. I, 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 the only thing that I noticed, like someone who's used to say a mid-engine gasoline-powered car, it's uh, um, it, the batteries are right behind us. So it does have a different um, center of gravity. Yeah. But it's not. It just you just get used to it. Right. The whole documentary should just be reaction shots. Definitely. Uh, you accelerating? Yeah. Like, ah. <laughs> so that's your <G4's> action. <laughs> that's it, that's your daily commute. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, I, I generally don't do that. <laughs> <laughs>
the actual car is fairly expensive. You know, the one that I ended up getting is about $160,000. My goal was to figure out a way maybe I could get that nice car for free. Also, I wanted to figure out some way that I could actually get my solar panel installation done for free as well. Well, it turns out when you're producing a film, and by the way, I'm not a tax expert, I'm not an accountant, I'm not giving or providing legal or tax advice here, just for the record, all right? But I will tell you that when you're producing a project like this, you have props and you have expenses. So when you check with your accountant, it is absolutely possible that maybe all of the things that you use in producing your productions could be free. Are we clear? All right. Well, the next reason that I made the Life with Tesla documentary is I wanted to increase my, the value of my personal brand. Now, I do have several businesses, several companies. One of them is Traffic Geyser. The other one is Monster Follow-Up. But inside of these, I also have a separate brand, a separate speaking career, and also uh, I've been positioning myself as an author. And in doing so, what I wanted to do is share with my existing customers some way of being able to prove that I, myself, and I could probably take anyone else and turn them into an instant expert and authority on practically any subject or topic. Now, I'm known as a video marketing expert, but no one knew in any stretch of the imagination that I knew anything about alternative energy or solar or electric cars. So by doing this, by creating a documentary, I'm able to position myself as an expert and authority in a very short period of time and start getting access to local and national news. Now as we move forward and position and either sell our companies at some point or maybe if I want to have my own television show someday or be a, a best-selling author, being able to get out there and communicate to the news and media is vitally important. Now the way you might think about this and how you could use it is if you have a product, a service of any nature, no matter where you live, a documentary could help position you, help you get national and local news, and again, increase your value. Now, if we move on, the other thing that I wanted to do is use the tools, some of my company tools, as resources in actually producing and promoting the product. So if you don't know this already, I am the co-founder of a company called Traffic Geyser. It's a tool that distributes videos all over the internet. And uh, Traffic Geyser is one of the vehicles that we're using to distribute and get the news out about this production all over the place. Also, these tools helped us create a Facebook presence. The next thing is I have a tool, a system called Monster Follow-Up. And with Monster Follow-Up, we can capture leads using mobile marketing. So if you visit lifewithtesla.com or go to facebook.com slash lifewithtesla, you can go in and either text your name and email address to a phone number, join the Facebook group, join our lead capture page. And what I ultimately did is gave away the documentary. But the bottom line is I'm actually creating a living case study, a living story, sharing and showing how my tools and resources can be used to build and promote virtually any business, any service, anywhere in the world. So, very important question I always ask myself is, look, whoever is selling some sort of a tool or resource, if they don't use it themselves, if they can't prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that it works and show physical proof of it, I wouldn't trust them. So this is going to increase the trust and proof that my tools actually work and can promote and market any product or service. Next, at some point in time, I thought, well, why not create a product? Why not create some sort of an information product where I would actually teach the step-by-step -step process, get into the nitty-gritties of how to create a documentary? Now, this video that you're watching right now will break it down and go through the steps, and there are a lot of people who will be able to just take this knowledge and know-how and just go out and do it themselves. I'm going to provide enough information to do that. Other people might say, hey, Mike, I'd like to know even more. Would you maybe teach me or educate me? Well, this is an opportunity to break this down find out if there are people who are interested in a product that gets into even greater detail. All right, next, by creating a documentary, this is giving me access to celebrities that may not have ever been interested in speaking with me in the past. Now, it turns out that there are people like George Clooney and Brad Pitt and Bill Maher and many other celebrities that drive the Tesla Roadster. Well, I immediately got access to the Tesla company. In fact, they fully supported this production, all right? And that gave me a certain amount of credibility. 
but by being able to share a documentary with some vision, the whole idea of being able to unhook from the grid, be able to li live and lead an oil-free lifestyle, be able to charge my car with the sun, and be able to power my home with solar energy is going to be attractive to a certain type or class of celebrity that frankly might be interested in maybe promoting using um, my own products and services someday. Or if I had access to them and got them involved, for example, with my wife's foundation, just like my child foundation, where we've been building schools and educating young girls in Africa, well, those are people who might be spokespeople for my wife's foundation at some point, too. They might also be very interested at some point in either endorsing um, a book or a product or even a television show that I produce someday. So the whole point of this is there are lots and lots of opportunities that sharing your vision, sharing your goals with the rest of the world can give you massive access to a lot of people. Now, the next thing that is very important is once you start showing up in the mainstream media, and you have books, maybe you've been on television, your value increases. Now, a celebrity, for example, can actually command hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to endorse or to promote a product or a service. Well, if you don't have access to a lot of people, if you're not visible and well recognized, your value will always be low unless you've got some remarkable skills that are in demand. A documentary is a very, very powerful way to increase your value. Get out there and command very, very high dollars, either um, to endorse or promote a product or to sell your products and services. And finally, a few of my other personal goals are someday be able to show up and speak on the TED platform. If you're not familiar with TED, go to TED.com. I happen to believe it is one of the most progressive. It's the highest value education you can ever give to yourself, your children, or someone you actually care about. If you're not familiar with TED, I highly recommend that you just consume all the videos there. But by getting on the TED stage, your value as a speaker, as a presenter, and your visibility worldwide dramatically increases. And finally, uh, one of my other big personal goals is to someday actually be interviewed on the Jon Stewart Show. I happen to think Jon Stewart is one of the most remarkable interviewers, has one of the funniest programs on television today. He's progressively minded. His audience actually is one of the biggest consumers of books. In other words, if you're an author, you want to sell a bunch of books, get on the Jon Stewart show. I also happen to think that he and I could become good friends someday. So I thought, well, this might be a way to be able to get myself on his show and be able to uh, parlay some sort of a relationship. And you've got to have value. You know, John doesn't have a lot of time, so he's going to associate himself with people who are like-minded and can also promote and build a platform for him as well. So that's just a few of the things. Now, I'm sure there's other things as well, um, but uh, that's a good place to start, all right? Now... Let's uh, move over here and talk a little bit about what a documentary is in the first place. So the bottom line is this. A documentary is sort of like it's a movie for all practical purposes. It's something that has both educational and entertainment value. And unlike a movie which has actors and sets and tells a story, a documentary is generally going to be based on something that is true and real. And it's going to be something that can be distributed either on television or online or through whatever uh, marketing channel or sales channel you might happen to be. But the idea is to push forward some sort of a vision or some sort of a mission or tell a story about a, a real person. So it could be a biography, an autobiography, or whatever it happens to be. In my case, the whole point and purpose of the Life with Tesla documentary was to share a vision, and that is it's actually easy, cost-effective, and reasonable and realistic at this point in human history to convert to an all-solar lifestyle, meaning you can power your home, you can power a car, it doesn't cost that much money, it pays for itself pretty rapidly, and despite the fact that the Tesla Roadster is in fact an expensive sports car, there are now very, very affordable electric cars that are out there. For example, the Nissan Leaf, as of right now, I just recently saw the Chevy Volt, which is a hybrid. I'm all about a 100% electric solution, but in the case of the Leaf, by the time you get your rebates back from the government and the state, you're looking at the $20,000 range for that vehicle, which is useful and usable by just about any commuter. But I believe in the end that uh, so being forced to use and depend upon 
oil as a source of power or fossil fuels is uh, dangerous, both to the security of uh, democracy as well as uh, our individual freedoms and rights. And I know that might sound a little bit political, but if you just think about it, this is the cause of most of the strife in our world today. It's a fight over power. No, not necessarily political power, but in fact, usable power and how we power our devices or things, transport, and after all, when you can move around, that represents freedom. So anything that somehow infringes upon power also infringes upon freedom. And that's one thing that I hold uh, dearest to me over all things is about freedom. So. Um, that's really uh, what my, my personal goal was. So again, I'm sure you could check out Wikipedia and read some sort of a dictionary definition of a documentary. But at the end of the day, I wanted to take some form of a big idea and share that in a cohesive fashion with as many people as possible and hopefully um, educate, inform, and uh, create some sort of a trend or a good reason why. I also wanted to cast a big net to a large number of like-minded people who would raise their hand and say, now Mike is a guy that I want to connect with as well. Maybe we could do business together. Maybe we could share ideas together. But if you want to get noticed, if you want your ideas to get uh, implemented and seen, you've got to find some effective way of telling your story and broadcasting it out to as many people as possible. And it turns out a documentary in mass media is a very reasonable and cost-effective way of doing so. All right. So. The next segment, why make one? Well, I covered a lot of that already, but at the end of the day, it's all about some sort of a vision, some sort of a mission, and some way of changing minds or educating folks. Now, we could go on down the line, and let's say you've got a product. Let's say you have a service. Let's say, for example, you're a chiropractor, and you've come up with some really interesting new strategy or technique that can actually heal someone. Well, if you are able to success, successfully over a period of time gather proof that your products and your services actually worked, share hero or success stories of customers whose lives have been transformed by the process that you use, why not gather that? Why not tell that in a storytelling fashion and be able to break it down and, and basically open up and say, I want to introduce you to a radical new way to heal and help people, something I've discovered, something I've used myself, and you're going to meet three people whose lives have been completely transformed by this new form of chiropractic care. Even if you think chiropractic care is complete nonsense and you have a bad taste in your mouth, I am going to show you proof, physical proof, of how this can work for you. And again, I just made that up, but that's effectively how you might open up a documentary. And then you'd introduce the audience to those three people. You'd give them a quick, what we call a Tarantino, in other words, a snapshot into their life before, during, and after they had this treatment or care. Or care. And then you'd show exactly how it worked. You'd show proof that it, in fact, works and exactly what happens. And then finally, have some sort of a wrap-up at the end. Now, bottom line here is when you look at documentaries, the best way to learn how to make a documentary is to watch lots of them. But the whole point and purpose, again, is to somehow create some sort of a vision, some sort of a mission, share that with as many people as possible, and start creating some change in some fashion or another. If you look at some big documentaries in the past that have been made, love them or hate them, um, I know there, were, um, there have been some big health uh, documentaries like Food Inc., for example, that really showed um, some of the ways that commercial farming um, can really have a negative impact on small business and entrepreneurs and traditional farmers and also all of the uh, chemicals that get used. Okay, that's a pretty good story. I suspect that in the near future, there's going to be some big documentaries being made about the oil sands um, and what's going on up in Canada, for example, something very controversial. There's certainly been documentaries made about tons of people, tons of things, but the whole idea is to raise and increase awareness. All right, so a few things about how to make one. <clears throat> now, I'm going to get into some of the nitty-gritty and the people, but the bottom line is this. When you want to make a documentary, you're going to have some sort of a vision or a mission. Now, it could be something all about you if you have something that's important to share, but if I were an author, for example, I would certainly consider creating a documentary to promote or market my book. If I had a brand new product or service or a business, I would definitely make a documentary about how that product and service or that business is transforming lives and actually helping people. But <clears throat> it all begins with story. And the best way to create story and create an emotional connection is it needs to be about people. People, people, people. So 
what is happening right now that is changing or effective, affecting lives in a positive way. Now in the context of Tesla, or the Life of Tesla documentary, it all began with this. Now there was a period of time when I was out looking around and I had made a commitment that someday I wanted to have an electric car. I hated oil, I hate buying gas, there's something about it that just rubs me the wrong way. And uh, I don't like the idea of buying something from giant corporations that are getting preferential treatment from our government and have sources that are coming from, uh, well, basically anti-democratic countries in a lot of ways. You know, I don't want to support them in any way. I wouldn't, for example, buy drugs from someone who might buy guns and come and kill my family, so why would I support something like that? And I know that might sound a little nuts to you, but it's just the way my brain works. And again, it's preservation of freedom. I want to support entrepreneurs. I want to support progressive minds. Not something, and in the, in the case of big oil in the United States, the federal government, due to the fact that there are lobbyists, are constantly in, in Washington, basically greasing and paying off uh, politicians, creating laws that don't support the small people. They don't support the entrepreneurs. In fact, they're giving them billions of dollars in tax credits while those big oil companies are making billions of dollars and distributing them to uh, their shareholders. It's just completely unfair. I'm not going to support it. So A, I had a passion. Obviously, you can tell I'm a little pissy about this whole thing, but that's just me, right? So that's one good reason. The next thing is the vision is someday, God, wouldn't it be great if I could have solar, charge my, uh, power my home, charge a car, and be able to drive free. Now, I've got to be realistic here. The amount of oil resources that it takes to build the car I'm driving is insane, okay? It doesn't make sense. In fact, I would probably guess that the amount of oil and resources that went into making that electric car are actually in excess of what a traditional car is made is right now. However, I want to support the research and development. It's the idea just as much as anything else. Because with the documentary, I can create some sort of a momentum, some sort of a change in thought. Maybe some other people will go, God, that's a good idea. I'd like to do that too. And maybe by driving the prices down of electric cars and solar and that kind of thing, more people will do it. And again, it's entrepreneurs that are installing these solar panels, okay? It's entrepreneurs who are involved in creating this kind of technology right now. It isn't necessarily a whole bunch of big, nasty businesses that are getting unfair advantages from our federal tax government that's basically controlled by a bunch of politicians who I don't trust, okay? So again, that's part of the fire here. And I'm being a little bit... Um, almost political on purpose just to get across the idea that this started with some passionate idea. So the idea is again more people using this technology, more people taking advantage of it and what I realized is uh, I originally <clears throat> raised my hand and I invested in, I put some money down on a car called an Aptera. It's a three-wheeled 100% electric car that was supposedly going to be made in, in Carlsbad. Nothing happened, okay? company for a whole bunch of dumb reasons never has produced a vehicle. So I became frustrated and then decided, well, screw it. I'm going to make my own. <clears throat> so I started doing a ton of research. I did lots of research. I started meeting with and talking to mechanics and engineers. And I seriously considered hiring an engineer and a mechanic and financing and buying the parts I needed and actually building a car that would be 100% electric. I think hybrids are complete nonsense. It's just Again, it's good that there's some progressive mindedness behind it, but at the end of the day, it's still powered by gas, still, you know, it basically isn't, it, it's, it's a kludge, all right? So I do the research, and after doing all the research, I figure out the amount of time I got to put into this. I literally have to take about six months off from my businesses and my work and focus my energy on it hire two people, buy the parts, and at the end of the day, I would have a compromised electric car, meaning I'd be lucky if I could go 45 miles on a full charge and go over 65 miles per hour, given the technology that's out there right now, and it probably would have cost me about 85,000 bucks, probably 120 by the time I paid the people and added the fact that that was an ideal estimate, all right? And then I went out and I test drove the Tesla. And honestly, the first time I took it out, I was like, it felt weird because I had recently gone on a, a, long, a little bit of a long distance exotic car tour and I had driven Lamborghinis and Ferraris and the Nissan GTR and a whole bunch of other exotics and I was spoiled. 
and the Tesla at first felt a little weird to me just because of the way the weight distribution set up and a couple other things as well. And I was like, I don't know if this is worth the money and blah, blah, blah. Well, I went home, slept on it a little bit, and I thought, how else am I going to get an electric car? I'm going to end up waiting a couple of years because the Aptera hadn't shipped yet. There was no other practical other solution out there except junk, junky little basically golf carts. And I took it out for another ride, and I was like, this thing is unbelievable. And uh, that's when it dawned on me that maybe I should investigate solar. So I started making a couple calls, and I found out, geez, going through the solar buying process is going to take some time. i got to meet with engineers, meet with suppliers. And then the idea popped in my head, okay, A, I'd love to get one of these cars for basically free. B, I'd love to power my house for basically free if I created a story Oh, and I'd like to educate and maybe document everything I'm doing, everything I'm learning, and be able to share that information or maybe write a book about it. I thought, why not make a documentary? I know plenty about film. I could use this as a way to prove that my technologies and tools work and all the other reasons that I shared with you earlier. And it'd be fun. And I got some really, really talented, smart people who work in my studio already who I know would love to make a documentary. And one thing, uh, another really important reason why you make documentaries is you can get awards. Now, we've already submitted the documentary to receive some awards, potentially get an Emmy as well as maybe another Effie, for example, which usually goes to the advertising world. That's another story altogether. But there's also film festivals all over the world. I mean, if we just submit to a couple hundred of them, there's a high probability we're going to win some awards. Okay, again, awards increase your value. It also increases the value of everyone on my team. They'll be excited about it. It'll create a mission, a combined mission that we can all look forward to doing. And uh, also, if they're going out and they want to pursue their careers later on, they can go out and say, I happen to be an award-winning filmmaker or cameraman or editor or whatever it is. Everyone wins, okay? So bottom line is this. How to make one just begins with some passion, and having a big why and a big reason. I just gave you a whole bunch of my reasons why, and I hope that you'd connect and relate to it. And then it just came down to what's the story. Now, the story in this case is guy wants to unhook from oil, wants to get as close to off the grid, remain free, support entrepreneurship, and uh, drive a no-compromise electric car, and share a vision and a mission with lots of people and show exactly what the process was in getting there. I thought, well, I just started bringing around a camera with me, documenting what went on, and one thing led to another. So I'll get to the people part in a little while and breaking this down, but, um, and that's really in the who you need. So the uh, who you need, I got to see if I have the, uh, the, I had a list here of, of everyone and it's not in front of me right now, so I'm going to just uh, wing it. But <clears throat> here's typically what you need. An executive producer in a project is someone who essentially finances a project or finds the money. Okay, I'll talk more about the money in a little while. Next, you have a producer. A producer is someone who has the vision, the concept, and puts the team together. I was basically acting not only as an executive producer, along with my two partners, um, but also as a producer in this case. It's my idea. I put together the team. The other person that I got was uh, another producer, and her name is Jenny Hamill. Now, it turns out that uh, Jenny is uh, a newscaster. She works for a local Fox affiliate. And um, I knew her due to some other work that she had been doing. And in this particular case, I'll tell you, this is what's great. Someone in the news business, a, in their, if they're an anchor in their news, Interestingly, people on TV don't make a lot of money in general, and uh, they're usually working on little bit stories. And in order to increase their value, they need awards, they need visibility. So a documentary is a great way. So I was able to talk to Jenny, and uh, in the past I've worked with other people who come from television, and when they connect with a project, they love to get involved, especially if you can pay them something. So I quickly made a deal with Jenny, and I said, would you write and would you produce this project with me? Great. We took care of that. All right, so uh, the next is I needed um, someone to direct and edit this. A guy named Brandon Perna, who um, had worked uh, here at, uh, at our studios before, um, was interested in this. And we started this project while he was still here. He ended up moving on to Los Angeles to pursue a, a, a neat opportunity to produce some shows. But he continued to work on this. 
Um, he did some of the shooting, but he also directed and edited this production. So what's a director do? What's an editor do? A director is someone who makes sure that they're going to show up, work with the talent, work with the camera people, make sure everything's coordinated on a tactical day-to-day -day level, and make sure you've got a cohesive story that can be told. Now, an editor is another incredibly, incredibly valuable uh, person here. In this case, case Brandon did both. And um, what uh, an editor does is basically takes all the segments of video and helps tell the story. Now, if truth be told, um, I had an idea for Life with Tesla. The fact of the matter is, we just shot a whole bunch of stuff, and we eventually kind of came up with a story concept, and it was really Brandon who orchestrated this thing together. Because, um, the, you know, again, this is not, nothing I'm proud of, but the reality is I've been running a couple businesses. We've been growing at an accelerated pace, and I just haven't had the time to focus on all the minutiae and the details. Brandon just raised his hand and monitored and managed this process throughout. Now, um, Jenny also did the research and uh, a bunch of the narration on the project as well. So having someone who does voiceover and be, is able to tell the story, but also someone who goes out and does the research. She, in fact, ended up uh, managing the relationships over at Tesla. We ended up getting Tesla engineers, and, and we had to get the publicity and legal department involved because we're using their brand and talking about them, and ultimately they had to approve the project as well. And they are, ended up being a sponsor as well. So that was another really, really important aspect of this. Next, I add Melissa, who's been responsible for putting together the graphics, the logos, building the website, building out the Facebook page, and that kind of thing. Somehow we had to market and promote this thing. And she also put together the keynote presentation that I'm sharing with you right now. Um, now here's what I'm going to just stop for a second and say. You don't have to have all these people. And building and creating your first documentary can frankly be done. It could be just you, even if you have no prior experience, as long as you have a story to tell. And the technology that you need is actually very, very cheap as well as a software tool. I'll talk more about that in a bit. All right. Now, um, we also got um, some what's known as B-roll. There's some footage that Tesla gave to us to use. So some of the footage that you saw of the cars driving through the valley, we didn't have to shoot all that stuff. Because we're making a product that ultimately is going to help sell cars, and I presented this in such a way, I basically, when I asked for permission to work on this project and use um, Tesla footage and be, um, get access to their engineers, I put together a little preview video, showed them some of the segments that we had already put together, and I said, here's the deal. I'm a Tesla enthusiast. I own your car. I paid for it. I drive it every day. I'm a huge enthusiast. I'm making the switch over to solar. I'm going to charge this, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm going to make a documentary and pay for it out of my own pocket. I'm not asking for any money from you. All I want, it, and I want you to know that my goal is to help you sell more cars because I believe in who and what you are. Okay? It was a little three to five minute pitch video that got sent off to them, and they immediately and, and I said, and by the way, before I release it, I will give you approval uh, rights on this. You can approve it um, before we distribute it. So it was like a no brainer for them. Okay. So uh, that was the next thing. Um, <clears throat> the next thing we had was we had other people who showed up on camera. Now, some of them were my team, some of the creative staff here who I was giving rides to at the beginning. Um, some of them are employees. And uh, you know, that's, part of that's just the fun side of, of the production. But we also got real Tesla owners. That was pretty easy. By coordinating with Tesla, we were able to get real people who had these vehicles and these cars they're big, uh, they're very interested in their, in their vehicles, and they also are what I would consider visionary folks, too. Um, then we had the photography, the video. Now, my internal team, for the most part, shot a tremendous amount of this content. So we have got Nick and Matt, um, Blake, uh, Brandon, Matt, uh, I already said Matt, uh, Sean. Uh, let's see, am I missing anyone else out, guys? Give me a call out here. Shake your head. No? Okay. Got everyone? And, um, oh, yeah, Christopher Jewett. So um, every one of the guys on the team here shot little segments of the videos at some point in time or another. Um, what I can tell you is, you know, obviously you're going, well, I don't have my own internal team. Tell you what, the best resource for finding great talent, especially production talent, is Craigslist, if you were in the United States. 
If you are in Southern California, there are Hollywood talented folks out there constantly looking for work. They're constantly looking for an opportunity to work on a project that could potentially get them an award or escalate their value as well. And you're only as good as your last production. All right. Now, you know, you get people all the time. It's like, yeah, I worked on, I don't know, Patch Adams made 20 years ago. It's like, who cares? All right. You know, those kinds of things were nice then. But if you're out in Hollywood, you better have a pretty consistent path of productions that you've been involved in. And uh, you need to be escalating all the time in terms of what your position is in making a film or your value is going to be fairly limited. So the bottom line here is um, finding high quality talent that is willing to work on a project, even on a fixed price uh, basis, is very reasonable and realistic. Okay. Um, next, we had music. Now, there's a gentleman named Oscar Flores who uh, put together the music. He's a friend of Brandon's in our case. Again, um, you can find a, a great talent in places like Fiverr.com, Craigslist, or if you ever find some music that you like online that you listen to, just find out who wrote and composed it. Go to their website, go to Facebook, track them down and say, hey, would you like to make some music for my production? And uh, it's possible to get a full soundtrack done for anywhere from $500 to $5,000, depending on what their experience is. Now, I don't have the permission to uh, say specifically what I paid for the soundtrack for this from Oscar. I will just say it was very, very reasonable. And I think he did an exceptional job because he literally scored the music to the production. He um, watched the, the production and actually put together and composed the music while watching it so it actually has a nice rhythm and a nice feel. So um, very, very talented. Um, and then the other thing that we had in this production was uh, our graphics. So we've got Glennon Wright, Matt Egenhaus, and, and Brandon Perna, who all did the animations that you saw on, on screen there. Again, finding motion graphics talent, be people who make graphics, you can use uh, Fiverr.com, 99designs, Crowdspring. These are crowdsourcing resources. But really all you need to do is have some sort of an idea of what you want. My recommendation is watch a bunch of documentaries and find segments that you like. And you can find these on YouTube or go to Netflix and watch them there and specify what you like and supply either clips of those videos to the designers um, at, or tell them to watch those things to get a feel of what you like. You don't have to be particularly imaginative or creative. And frankly, you don't have to have graphics. Yeah, I mean, you could literally just sit down with a piece of paper and draw on it or take a whiteboard and, and use a dry erase marker and put a camera on top of that and it'll be fine, okay? Whatever you need to push the story forward is what's important. So the technical stuff isn't that important. Um, the only other big thing that I'll say here is typically when you're doing a documentary, you've got someone who's responsible for lighting. Good cameraman's going to be able to take care of that. And then audio. Someone who's going to be miking you up. And then, again, the, the whole world of production can get sophisticated and complicated if you allow it to do so. But the good news is when you're working with a producer and or a director, sometimes the producer director is the same, they're going to know teams of production people who are happy to come out along and do work with you, and they're going to know all this stuff. All you have to be clear with is what is your story, what is the outcome, and when you can basically describe that and pitch it to a director or producer, they're going to know exactly what to do and how to do it, and they're going to give you ideas you never would have thought of. That was what was so great about this team. I mean, they just went away and I said, here's the vision. And uh, I directed parts of these things and, and gave ideas. But for the most part, they just ran and made it. And the end result, in my opinion, is fantastic. So that's the who part of the piece, all right? So the next big question you've got to be asking by now is, how much does the documentary cost to produce? So well, here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, this documentary I could have produced for one third of what it cost me if I would have personally managed the heck out of it. But again, at the end of the day, I had a lot of stuff going on and I had to choose between losing time and money in my business or um, saving a couple of dollars in the documentary. And uh, it was pretty easy for me to just say, I've just got to let a few things go here. But if I would have been producing this thing and watching it and monitoring it like a hawk and had more involvement, probably could have produced the whole thing for about fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars. 
Now it turns out that the total out-of-pocket expense, not including the car and all the other stuff and some incidentals, I think by the time I pay legal, um, all the talent, et cetera, is in the forty to fifty thousand dollar range. Okay. Now again, could have done it for a lot less, and um, you know I just I just had to make some decisions, and it wasn't done as efficiently as it could have been, and it wasn't planned out as as well as it could have been. So here's what I will tell you. The number one thing that'll keep your costs under control is if you plan and create a script first and storyboard. In other words, decide what kind of images and elements you want to be showing. Uh, and the more planning you do, the less money it's going to cost. And uh, the fact of the matter is, the only thing you need, and this is a big important lesson I learned 30 years ago when I started actually doing production work, is the best producers, the best directors, and the best writers in the world have two tools. One's a yellow pad and the second one is a pencil, okay? And a little bit of time, which is, you know, go put yourself in a coffee shop. If you're a coffee drinker, just drink pots and pots of coffee and draw stuff, okay? Start writing. Now, if that isn't your talent, there are tons and tons of writers out there who love doing this stuff. It is their passion, it is their art. But you've got to start with the idea. So, the, the how much category is this. It all comes down to how long it's going to take, how many people you need, and what kind of gear you need. The good news is because equipment is so cheap today, I mean, you could basically make a documentary with an iPhone. I mean, really, an iPhone camera, it turns out, I don't know if you noticed, the, uh, the uh, roller coaster video in that was shot in the back of a roller coaster um, that I shot at in Mission Bay in San Diego. I just went on there one day with my son and his friend, and I held up my iPhone, started recording, and you know, I just held it up like this. It's 720p. It looks great, all right? So um, it's shaky as hell, but that's just because, you know, I didn't have anything to support this thing with. But the point is, equipment isn't your problem, okay? People aren't your problem. There's tons of people who love to do this thing. It is their art. It's their passion. It's their life. But they need a story. They need a plan. And your budget is going to either cost X or it's going to be five or ten times that based upon how much planning you do ahead of time. Okay, And the more of these you do, the better you get at it. And that's why it's so important to surround yourself with talented people who've done it before if you're going to finance this thing with your own money. Now, on the top of, topic of financing this thing, um, what I'll, I'll tell you is the good news is, uh, well, the good news, bad news is this entire production from concept to completion probably took about nine months, eight months. I got it from pretty, I started on it pretty much from the day I got the Tesla. And again, it could have probably been done in about two months. However, um, due to uh, weather and some challenges with the solar company, um, it took about four months at first to get all my solar stuff done. Okay, just so happens. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. I won't get into all the details here, but um, that affected things. Now, why am I telling you about that? It's because if you think about it, let's just say again that the you know it cost me forty grand. Well, if it took, let's say, eight months, that means it was about $5,000 a month. So it's absolutely possible to produce a documentary with cash flow. You don't have to raise all the money all at once, okay? The next thing is, um, if I would have pushed this a little bit further and uh, up front, I probably could have gotten the entire documentary sponsored. Probably could have gotten a little bit of money from uh, Tesla directly. Probably could have gotten, in fact, I know I could have gotten money from some solar installers if I would have spent more time featuring them. I could have gotten money from some other people in the solar business. So something just to think about is, as long as you can present an idea and a plan to someone who can benefit from a documentary, it's easy to raise money for these things. Now, after doing one, I know for a fact I could go out and probably raise hundred or $250,000 in a matter of a couple of weeks based upon just an idea, all right? And a little bit of a plan, kind of like the, the presentation I'm showing you right now. So um, I've already answered this, but the how long? Again, uh, a documentary realistically, in most cases, is probably going to take anywhere from about three months to sometimes three years, depending on how much research you've got to do, how much acquisition you have to do, what kind of stories you're acquiring, um, who you need access to, travel, and production. Um, the, the one thing about any kind of a documentary is even with Life with Tesla, we probably went through about, um, I'm going to say 10 different edits of this thing. 
and the trailer went through probably a dozen of them before we happened upon something that felt right, okay? So um, one thing about filmmaking is there is definitely a structure. You know, there's a beginning, there's a middle, and an end. If there's a hero story where you've got a hero who's, you know, basically pathetic down here and has to overcome some gigantic problem and uh, has some personal demons and discovers a tool, discovers a resource, discovers a mentor, and you allow some time to fall in love and really like that character and then go through the typical what's known as a story arc um, and finally go through the big battle at the end and, and uh, uh, you know, rescue the princess or whatever the, the big accomplishment is and then resolve the story. It just takes some time to figure out what you need and how to do that, okay? Even a documentary has some sort of a structure, has some sort of a flow. So, um, you know, the more time you spend, you know, uh, finding and, and, and uh, planning this out, no matter how well it's scripted, no matter how well it's storyboarded, it's possible that you put the thing together and your first edit will just stink, okay? It's going to require a little bit of adjustment, a little bit of tweaking. And um, I think, uh, and I've said this for years, expectations are the enemy of happiness. You can't plan everything out all at once. Sometimes it just comes down to when you see that edit, you got to look at what it feels like, put it in front of a bunch of people and get some reactions and some re responses and find out what's wrong with this thing, okay? So I think uh, what is important is think of in terms of three months to three years, if you're doing a business style documentary, I think uh, the four to, to eight months time frame is very, very realistic. Um, and again, could be done very affordably. I believe with um, some good structure, some good planning, a um, person can put together a very, very nice documentary um, for around uh, $10,000 or so. All right? So, how to get started? Well, Again, I talked a little bit about this, but the bottom line summary is you got to have a mission, you got to have a vision, and you got to know who you're talking to. I didn't spend a lot of time on that, but knowing your audience is really important. Now, for me, I wanted to create this, this uh, documentary for a number of different people. One of them was I wanted to speak to uh, the people who I know were potential Tesla owners. I found Tesla owners in general to be progressively minded, highly technical, Almost all of them are entrepreneurs. Turns out a large number that I've met are all successful business owners who've sold their businesses. Basically, most of them are um, fairly well off. In fact, many of them are multi-multi-millionaires. Some of them own very, very large corporations. Um, and, uh, and I thought, well, this is another thing. Someday, if I choose to sell my businesses, these are the kind of people who have access to big capital and big investment firms as well. So I thought, well, I'm going to communicate to those kind of folks. Also, I wanted to find progressively minded, green-minded technology people. Now, I'm not talking about, um, you know, weird hippie types. You know, obviously, this is communicating and speaking to people who can afford um, this kind of a lifestyle. So it's definitely a higher-end um, person, and they're definitely idealists. Um, another thing that I, I definitely did is I created this documentary with my own customer base in mind. I found over time that the people who buy uh, Traffic Geyser and Monster Follow-Up and our other products and services are um, progressively minded, fiercely independent, freedom-driven. They want to benefit from all the things that having their own business can give them. Um, many of them are what I would consider libertarian-minded, okay? So I'm dancing on the political spectrum here briefly, but they're people who value being left alone by their government and don't particularly trust politicians, okay? And uh, would rather solve the problem themselves. They're implementers, they're self-starters, they're independent-minded folks, okay? And um, I also know that a lot of them can identify and associate with this idea of, man, I'd love to do my own documentary as well. So it was around those kinds of things. So again, just knowing who your audience is, what you're saying, and what you're speaking to them, and also the outcome, which I covered earlier. It's like, I wanted access, okay? So if you know what your outcome is, you know who you're uh, communicating to and who you're producing for, and uh, what you want this to do, the rest is pretty easy. It's really just a matter of what do they need to hear? What objections might they have that, would, uh, that you need to overcome to tell your story and get them to raise their hands and say, this is just like me. Now, interestingly, a good documentary is very, very similar to a great marketing video, okay? 
Now, um, if you're a scientist, you might uh, you know, want to present both sides of the story. Now, I could have gone in there. I didn't want to. didn't matter to me, frankly. I don't care about the other side of the story. But I know I could bring in people and say, ah, solar is a big ball of hooey, and electric cars are junk, and it doesn't, doesn't make sense, and they can only go 200 miles on a charge, and it takes too long to do it. You know, it's like, I don't want to try to convert people who don't want to be converted. As I often say, the last thing you want to do is be a Christian trying to convert a Muslim into a Christian or take a Christian and turn them into a Muslim. It ain't going to happen. You'll probably get shot. It's a bad idea. So you want to be focused on communicating your message and your mission to people who are already there or on their way to get there. All right. So uh, a couple things here. Getting back to the resources, and I've covered them already. So we've got the writer, the producer, the director, uh, the cameraman. Uh, we've got editor, we've got lighting, we've got audio producer, music talent, a location scout. That's someone who goes out and looks for wherever you're going to be shooting. Having a studio, having an executive producer, in other words, the money people, and then the tools. So what I want to do is just tell you a little bit about the tools very briefly because I didn't spend any time on that yet about the equipment, okay? Now the good news is the equipment you need these days, it's cheap, it's easy to get, and you can find people already have it and you don't have to buy any of the stuff. Now we did produce this production with some really nice equipment. Um, we have some great camera gear, some good audio equipment, lights, etc. But for the most part, you could get by and produce a very, very fine documentary with a $500 video camera, um, a small light kit, and a halfway decent lavalier mic. All right? Now, in this particular case, like the production I'm making right now, we're in a quarter million dollar studio here. It's all high definition. It's multiple cameras, so I can go between this camera. I can go between this camera. We've got big screens behind us and all this stuff. You don't need all this stuff, all right? And again, much of this can be rented. And if you know a director, you know a producer, they all have connections these days. And um, it's never about the equipment. And as I was talking about earlier, look, you could sit down, you could produce an entire documentary with nothing more than an iPhone, okay? This thing shoots 720p. It'd look great, okay? And I've told, uh, I've had lots and lots of engineer friends in my uh, life. And by my nature, I'm an engineer. I'm very fussy, very detail-oriented about technical precision but I long learned a very, very important lesson, which is don't engineer for engineers. They're not the ones buying your product. Okay? The people you're engineering for are the average Joe who couldn't tell 720 f 720p from 720 uh, from 1080p to whatever to save their lives. They don't care. What they're looking for is story. They're looking for passion. They're looking for heart. And they're looking for a connection. And that's the whole point and purpose of putting this whole thing together. You are telling a story with a purpose in mind. You've got to have that why, and your passion is going to come across more than anything else, as well as your vision and your mission. And that, again, is the biggest goal that you have whenever you're creating a documentary. So here's what I'm going to um, do is I'm going to cut now to the uh, actual trailer to The Life with Tesla. And uh, before I do that, and then when I come back, I'm going to give you an opportunity here to, uh, if you want some next steps, I'm going to tell you what those next steps are. So I'm going to cut right now to a slide that shows a phone number, and that phone number is 858-333-8534. And when we're done with this production, we will come back and display that after I uh, come back from the uh, trailer. But here's the basic summary and what I want to close at right now, if we can have the camera back on me, please. And that is this. I am considering creating a full course on how to create a documentary. And it would include more of the step-by-step, -step, an opportunity to meet and, and uh, you'll have interviews with people involved in this and really get into more of the how-to side, including some of the production side as well. And uh, if you're interested in uh, going through that and learning more, I encourage you to text your name and email address to that phone number and you'll get some information at the time I decide to do it might be a week, a month, a year from now. I'm not sure right now, but it's your opportunity to raise your hand and say, yeah, this sounds cool. I'd like to know more, and maybe uh, I'd like to learn a little bit more from Mike and his team. So um, I do, once again, want to leave you with this. The opportunity right now in this world at this time to create a story 
with a vision and a mission that only a documentary can deliver is greater than ever before. The equipment available to produce these things, like I said, for you know, you can do it from your phone, you could actually make a documentary, is here right now. Your ability to just tell a story and start with nothing more than a pencil, piece of paper, and a little yellow notepad and collaborate with incredible talented people who are storytelling experts, they love to do this, is right now. And just like I've done with Life with Tesla, I didn't talk about the distribution necessarily, but the quick summary of that is I'm giving this thing away. Now, why would I give away something that cost me $40,000 to do? It's because A, I know by building my value, being able to get national and international attention would be very, very expensive to do if I had to pay for it. I'm basically going to get free PR and publicity. Eventually, a lot of these people might say, well, what else does Mike do? And they might find their way to my products and services and buy them. Also attracting um, talent and uh, access to celebrities as well as potentially people who might acquire and buy some of my other products or services or come back and say, hey, you know what, Mike? I want you to produce a feature film for me or a documentary for me. Maybe or maybe not. I don't know if I'll be interested in that or not. The whole thing is if you want to increase your value, you've got to cast a net. If you want to attract high quality customers into your life, you've got to tell a story. And uh, if you're not out there telling stories, if you're not out there actively marketing and promoting and sharing your vision and your mission and who and what you are and what you stand for and building trust all the time, creating connection and building relationships with this remarkable world that is completely interconnected, you ain't making a difference. This is a great time to do that. And ultimately, if you're using a tool like Traffic Geyser, you can build your blog, you can use Twitter, you can use Facebook, just like we have. We're actually distributing the Life with Tesla documentary on iTunes. We're going to be selling it on the iTunes store. We're putting it in Amazon, and ultimately, we're going to try to get it on Netflix as well. Now, yes, I'll sell it on there, but that's just because I want to distribute it through as many channels as humanly possible. And there again is the big opportunity here. The world is completely connected. You've got access to sell and produce and promote your vision, your message on something as simple as a mobile phone like this one. Why not take advantage of that? And you can do it very, very easily. And there are wonderful people there to support and help you. So what I'll do right now is cut to the trailer. And when I come back, you'll see the still slide where you can text your name and email address to 858-333-8534 if you want to know more. And uh, if you're outside of the United States, just put a, a plus one in front of that um, for the international code. So my name is Mike Koenigs. Thank you so much for watching this, and let's cut to the trailer. Well, the first thing you always get is the Tesla grin. <laughs> Once you first feel that exhilaration and the pure acceleration, it's, it's incredible. <laughs> oh, my God. There's little question that when you go to a gas pump, you're no longer just filling up your car, you're submitting to a sense of helplessness. And I know how I feel every time I have to put gas in my tank. Versus right now, I haven't bought gasoline in over four months. That's a great feeling. If you really support the American way of life, which is innovation, freedom and liberty, you would take a look at driving an electric car. <laughs> I'm charging and powering my home and my car completely from the sun. That's a pretty good feeling. Our owners are very much the ambassadors for Tesla and for our brand. We're a for-profit company that doesn't make a profit because everything we make, we invest back into research and development. Oil, on the other hand, it stands for everything America is against, in my opinion. 
why not take a chance? Why not be the difference?